Before we call it a day on our discussion of intervals, there are a few more things you might like to know about. You're listening to Music Student 101. And now, your hosts. Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. You know, that last episode was kind of theory heavy, so um, I'm not sure about you, Matt, but uh, today I myself am feeling kind of laid back. Me too. I've been sitting over here making up chord progressions on your keyboard. Do you like the new keyboard sound, the new piano sound? I do. It's got a little bit more of a of a sophisticated, rich, kind of complex sample behind it, so... Yeah, and if you listen to our MIDI episode, you kind of know what we're talking about. Um, the pri- uh, Up until recently, I've been using Contact. It's a software, a sampling software. Who makes that? Native Instruments. Native Instruments. That's right, yeah, Native Instruments. So yeah, Native Instruments makes this software called Contact, and we've right. been using the Grand Piano for that. Yep. And then I recently got this new software as a part of an upgrade package for Pro Tools. Just got it for free uh, called Addictive Keys. Ah. Uh, and we're just trying it out today. It's the Grand Piano Studio Grand Sound. I love free stuff. I do too. And I think it really does have a pretty good sound. We'll have to go back and uh, compare them later on. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, maybe you'll hear more of that. We're always trying to upgrade and improve we're, yeah, our production we're... <laughs> value here at Music Student 101. <laughs> <laughs> trying to uh, improve listener experience all the time. Uh-huh. You know, for everything from new samples to more caffeine in your hosts. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Cold brew, baby. <laughs> Quick and easy. Uh. You know, um, back in November, we talked about intervals. We kind of, back in... Uh, November and October of 2016, early on in this podcast, we right. we began talking about intervals in theory and in ear training. Right, yeah. Now, really, uh, there's not a lot of time spent on intervals, you know, in, in the typical curriculum. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, they're, they're a big deal when you uh, first start doing ear training. And then at some point, you're kind of, it's kind of assumed that you're going to learn your intervals and then move on to other stuff. Uh, some people, uh, some people succeed at that whole moving on thing better than others. You know, there are a lot of people that never really get the hang of intervals. Mm. You know, not because they're not as good at this kind of stuff as other people or anything like that, but you know, probably just because you know they they didn't really have a chance to work it out in their own time. Yeah, and then you know, problems kind of creep up later. Right. And actually, um, I don't want anyone to get discouraged because even though I'm a podcaster and educator and whatnot, <laughs> you'd think I'd just be this Einstein of ear recognition by now, right? <laughs> but uh, the fact of the matter is, I'm taking vo- vocal lessons. And oh, yeah. um, it turns out that, that because I've been doing folk music for a long time and just kind of standard rock, um, I've had some problems with my intervals as far as singing intervals. Oh, sure. We, yeah. did, <laughs> we did this piece called uh, Close Every Door from... Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I think that's the, the full title. Uh, either way, it involved, especially on the cadences, a whole lot of, uh, for me, uncharted uh, melodic ideas, you know, and uh, a lot of harmonic minor resolutions. Right. And I found that to be very challenging. So he said, well, let's try some ear training. And, of course, I said to myself, you know, well, I've done plenty of ear training, you know. Uh, this, this should be a snap, right? But, uh, Folks, you will never be done with ear training. Oh, good. Thank you. Never will you be done with ear training. Uh, my students all the time, especially when, once they get to ear training four, you know, like, hey, Ray, we passed. We're done with ear training. And I tell them all the time, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You s- Nobody's ever really done with ear training. This is a lifelong process. You know, it's one of those use it or lose it kind of things. It seems so. It seems so. Even if uh, you're using it and thereby ostensibly not losing it, you know, there's still parts of it you're going to be better at you know, and uh, places that you're going to need to work on ear training wise. This is true for everybody. Okay. It's, true for, it's true for you. It's true for me. You know, it's it's uh, true for everybody. You know, teaching ear training has, has actually helped me a lot. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, just because, for one thing, it forces me to practice it every day. 
you know, which is which is the one thing that you know I can be bad at. <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, but, but, but yeah, you know, it, it, it's something you're never, you're never really done with it. You practice it all your life and it, there's always little challenges and things that creep up. Right, right. And I guess today we're going to kind of cover some of those things. Yeah. And maybe we, have a little bit of a, um, an extension to our discussion, our prior discussion, because we might touch on some things like compound intervals and, uh. Yeah, right. A little, a little, um. A little chance for if any of you out there, as we were thinking, maybe you were, were sort of saying, but, 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 at the end of you know <laughs> some of our previous ear training, we're, we're trying to we'll, we'll try to tackle some of those butts. I yeah. guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Well put. Hey, yeah. You know. Um. So, butt number one. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, <laughs> just to be nice, why don't we real quickly go over the basic intervals all within the same one octave? Good plan. Just to Good kind plan. of refresh. All right. Unless you're binge listening, this has been a while. Yeah, unless you're binge listening, this has been a while. And even if you are binge listening, this has been quite a few episodes You've back. You've absorbed now. a lot of stuff between now and then. Go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we can pick this up in the morning. Okay, so um, quick, the basic intervals, what we call simple intervals. Yes. Uh, intervals an octave or smaller. Um, so we start with uh, a one, and there is a such thing as a perfect unison. You know, whereas just if two instruments were playing the same note, you know, if a piano and a guitar, for example, were playing the same note, then, you know, we would call that AP1 a perfect unison. Mm -hmm. uh, can't do it on the piano alone, obviously, but... Because that note is already occupied. Right, but but that is technically a thing. Um, so, but then the next, uh, the next one up from that is our minor second. You know, everybody kind of remembers that as the Jaws theme, right? Yeah. Um, Right. They really sting when hit together. Yeah, sting really bad. Yeah, yeah. and then there's the uh, the major second. Uh, um, that's one that I had a trouble with. Really? Believe it or not, major second. Oh wow! He like, yeah, he would play a note and say, "While I'm playing this note, sing a major second. <laughs> and man, I had trouble with it. I really did. Just sing up the major scale because it's just the next note up. I would intend to do that, but I found myself singing up the Phrygian scale or the Locrian <laughs> scale. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So just the next note up the major scale. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, the next uh, interval we have is the minor third, uh, which would be uh, which would be you know the next note up a minor chord arpeggio. You know, if you sang those in choir class. play them together. Yeah. yeah, so minor third. Um, next one will be the major third. And this is just this is just a sound you're going to get in your head at some point. This I do uh, the same kind of approach with the uh, arpeggio. <clears throat> yeah. Like in the shower <laughs> Which, which is when you sing, right? Which is where you sing, right? Um, I'll try and do it. I'll try and hit a, a ma major arpeggio, and then with yeah. the same root after that, hit the minor arpeggio. Yeah. There's another weak spot for me is if, if, like I said, if two guys are singing root over here and then, and then fifth over here, and I'm the guy who has to do the third. <laughs> again, I, I think I mentioned that before, but that's Ooh. kind of another weak point. Scary, yeah. Scary thing to do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good place to practice. Indeed. So, yeah. Um, this is just a sound that needs to be in your ears, and with enough practice it will be. Uh, perfect fourth. It comes next, and this is uh, this is the here comes the bride, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, you can also think of it as uh, going from scale degree five up to scale degree one. So, in in sort of a theory explanation, a harmonic practice, it's uh, so. Um, Uh, from there we have what is alternatively known either as the augmented fourth, the diminished fifth, or perhaps most commonly as the tritone. Yeah. Now, didn't really play a very huge role in music until the 20th century. Um, at least not by itself. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, uh, it is the, um... Make sure I'm saying this right. It is it is the interval 
that uh, that is so important to a, a seven chord, right? So like, well, it is also uh, it's also in a five seven, and it is also uh, the uh, the the first opening notes of uh, either the uh, the Leonard Bernstein song Maria from West Side Story, you know? mm-hmm. right? Um, it's also in a, a favorite, uh, in a very popular and, and uh, much beloved cartoon about yellow colored people <laughs> that we all know and love, you know? Yeah, buddy. Yeah. And it also, you know, people will say it sounds like, uh, like French police sirens. There is something very alarming about this uh, interval. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pete, I've even read reports that say uh, babies naturally cry in tritones to, oh, wow. to, to sort of stress out the mother and make her want to, to come take care of it. I'm going to listen for that next time I hear a baby cry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if it's ever been conclusively proven, but you know, it, it is one of those things that I've heard floating out there in the in the universe. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. um, don't, Moving don't on. give it milk. Let it cry a little longer. I'm trying to see what kind of compositions can come out of this baby. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, one more thing about like the a... tritone real quick. Um, <laughs> when you play them together, they don't have that same sting that the minor second had. I mean, there's a dissonance, and the important thing is the dissonance level because that's where yeah, you get the five yeah. to one kind of resolution. Yeah, you know, I think, I think a lot of the dissonance level in the tritone is sort of... I think we've gotten used to it. I think we hear it so much in... in um, music today, like I said, because it's in, when you play a 5-7 a chord, yeah, um, that, mm. that dissonance is there. Between the 3rd and the 7th. Right, right, yeah, between the 3rd and the 7th. So I think, and you know, 7 chords are just such a part of our, you know, uh, lexicon at this point that, you know, um, uh-huh. That that, uh, that I think we just have gotten used to it. Okay. It, it, for for most of musical history, it was considered extremely dissonant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They said the same thing about the perfect fourth way back when. Yeah, the perfect fourth was actually considered a dissonance. Yeah, because it was it was uh, unstable. Um, Until people got more used to it. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, moving on, the perfect fourth's inversion, the perfect fifth. Uh, um. To me, this kind of sounds like Roman music or something. Yeah. Like, not real Roman music, like cheesy TV Roman music. Yeah. Ben, ben, the Ben-Hur. Yeah. Sorry, right. races. You know, kind of. Um, it's also, obviously, you know, the interval which all Western tonal harmonic music is built around. You know, it's, it's really... Discovering this interval is, is, was, is, is the key to everything. Kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. Uh, in in uh, choirs that are learning to sing your arpeggios, you know. This note right here. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll get used to playing that pretty pretty easily, you know. It's one uh, of the most constant intervals that isn't a unison or an octave, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, it is, in fact, the second most consonant. Interval, so it is. It is the most consonant interval that is not the unison or the octave. Um, and then there is the uh, the minor six, you know, uh, which is uh, what's a good song for the minor six? I know the band Evanescence seemed to like this interval a lot back in the day. Um, I know we had an example on the last episode, but I can't remember. What yeah, it was. yeah, there's just something I love about this interval. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's, particularly when it resolves down to the five. Yeah, 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 which is kind of where it wants to go harmonically is down that half step. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the major six is, of course, my Bonnie lies over the ocean, right? And it's also, you'll notice, it's, it's actually also, um, theory speaking, it's usually uh, 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 it's usually used sort of as a soul to me kind of thing. 
Yeah, so. so. Hmm. Yeah, um, which is the way it's used in, in My Body Lies Over the Ocean. Does it, does it do that in the NBC jingle as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Huh. Yeah. Um, Major six. Yeah, and so that's the two things, My Body Lies Over the Ocean or the NBC jingle. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and then um, the minor seventh, if you guys remember uh, Star Wars, or not Star Wars, if you guys remember Star Trek, the original Star Trek. Or something like that. But that, that, <laughs> the, the, this. Yeah. yeah. Um. And, and you know, if you also if, if you if you hear chords this well, you know those are the uh, those are the border notes in a root position seven chord. Yeah. Mm. Minor seventh, and then the major seven, which it's hard to ignore the uh, the desperate pull that that has to try to resolve. Upward, right? You know, when you when you hear these two notes, yeah, and you just almost can't help it. You want to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. You know, the minor seven, that flat seven, to me is is you know, it's like that mixolydian mode, which is based on the it's right, based on the yeah. fifth scale degree, but at the same yeah, time, yeah. it doesn't have that urgency. It it seems yeah. more stable. Has, yeah, has has a little bit less of that urgency. Yeah. And then you hear that major seven, you just uh, know. It's time to go oh, somewhere. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. What are you doing? Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, of course, uh, we end with the perfect octave, which sound, which is really uh, the absolute most consonant interval possible. Yeah. There you go. If you, and if you want to hear us talk more about uh, these basic intervals, we have uh, that podcast uh, back in the day that we did. Uh, yes, episode number... Episodes actually numbers nine and ten. Definitely check that out. Yeah, because we actually we talk a little bit about singing the major scale using numbers and solfege. We get a little more deep into. Yeah, it. yeah. We talk about some uh, strategies for hearing and distinguishing between those intervals and things. I think so. So that's a few minutes on the basic intervals. Yeah. Now let's dig a little bit deeper because may I think I think after this episode we'll said mostly I want to have said mostly everything. Most of what we need to say about <laughs> intervals, right? So we're done with this after. This. Yeah. Won't you be glad? Yeah. So you know, get what you need out of it. Nah, we're we're kidding. Nah, this is, we 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 love intervals here at Music Student One Hundred and One. <laughs> um, but where do we go from here? Um, I guess we just keep traveling a little further away. Yeah. Compound intervals. Compound intervals. Well, we should we should probably take a second to explain what we mean by a compound interval. A compound interval is any interval greater than an octave. So, you know, we ended with our our perfect octave. You know, if I'm to take that if I was to take that top note, move it up a half step, we have this new interval hmm. which is sort of the spread out equivalent of a minor second. Yeah. Right? It's got the same two notes as a minor second, but they're an octave apart. And we, so we will therefore call it a minor ninth. Yeah. 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 I feel like that sting is kind of gone, but it's still kind of there. It's very strange. Yeah it's, it, yeah, it's just been stretched out a little bit. That original sting, the simple interval of a minor second. You can hear the waves. Yeah. Yeah. Taking that highest note, pushing it up an octave, gives us the minor ninth. And so the minor ninth is sort of the the, the compound interval uh, partner of the minor second. Okay. Uh, ditto the major ninth and the major second. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the major second sounds a lot more palatable as well. Yeah, they're, they're all going to sound a little more pal- palatable just because of the way the overtone series works and the way frequency ratio. Uh, works in, in sound waves and things, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because of sciencey stuff like that, anytime intervals get bigger, they they tend to be, the dissonances are less noticeable, mm-hmm. even if they're kind of still there. 
Yeah. Right? Um, and as far as compound intervals go, uh, we kind of go up from there. Minor tenth. You know? So that's the actual third? That's the actual minor third, third yeah. Okay. And then uh, the major third becomes a major tenth. Right? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we can just keep going. Perfect eleventh. Yeah. Um, augmented... 11th or diminished 12th, but we still really just kind of call it a tritone. Even with all those octaves in between. Yeah. Uh, perfect 12th, you know, and expanded perfect 5th, right? Um, I can get on board with that. Yep. Minor 13th, an expanded minor 6th, and major 13th, and expanded major 6th. And then we have the major and minor 7th, which is a major and minor 14th. And then now we're two octaves apart with a perfect 15th. So, in my head, I said to myself, wait a minute, we're at 15, why, why aren't we at 16? But then why aren't we at 16? It came to uh, me that, well, go ahead, yeah. Uh, well, remember that there's only seven notes in a scale. Right, right. When yeah. we get to that eight, we're actually starting over. So Yeah, one. when we're at eight, we're actually kind of starting over scale-wise. But uh, yeah. It folds in on itself. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Kind of folds in on, it, on itself. So that's what we mean when we say compound intervals. Okay. Ready for your question about compound intervals? Yeah, let's let's do that. Okay, so I guess it's more of an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, once we got to that 15th, mm -hmm. moving on from that, right. we don't go to the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th. Nah, not, not typically. Once you're talking about a compound interval, we just continue, we, we will just continue to call it, you know, you know, going on from that, a, a minor ninth or major ninth or whatever, you know, we, we don't really count the number of octaves. We just count whether it's smaller than an octave or bigger than an octave. And even sometimes we don't even do that. <laughs> right. I mean, sometimes we'll still call it major third, even though it, it's split by more than an octave, you know, when we're being kind of lazy, we'll, we'll, we'll continue even doing that. So. so on this 61 key keyboard, I'm seeing a very low C over there. And then let's hear let's hear uh, the most compound interval this keyboard can handle, right? So at sixty-one keys, that is five octaves. Uh, is, is yes. So that would be a a perfect fifteenth. Let's hear uh, a major fourteenth. Oh. That's very Metroidy. Metroid. You remember that game Metroid? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but all that to say, um, what's happening here is a major seven. Yep. Um, no, well, you know, technically, uh, you could call it a major seventh. You could technically call it a, a major 14th. Hey, that's another good question. Does it make a difference? Uh, it depends on, point? it depends on context. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really always make a difference, but if you want to be completely technical, you could call that a major 14th. Like when you're uh, analyzing something in theory, if you say a 5-9 chord, you know, that's heavily implying not that there's a 5 chord with a second in it, but but that, you know, you have gone up that octave. Right. You know. So compound intervals, there you go, right? Yeah, that's what they are. Uh, how do we listen for them? Yeah. What I like to do, uh, if I'm, you know... Compound interval. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to take that for that bottom note, mm. and in my head, imagine myself singing it up an octave. Mm. And, you know, and remember that singing it up an octave is just sort of. It's more singing in a different range. It feels more like singing in a different range than like singing up a di distance of notes. You know. It, it, think of it more as like switching from maybe your bass voice to your tenorish voice, you know, or, or towards a, a falsetto voice or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right. It's more of a voice shift than it is singing up X number of intervals in terms of how it's going to feel, you know, and how it's going to sound to you. So I like to back to our compound interval. I like to sing. I like to imagine what that note sounds like an octave up, and then just do the same sing from that octave up to the note. So, so, 
and then, and then my real top note is a third above that. Right? A third above that. Because <laughs> you can talk. You can yeah. sing down from the third, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, singing down a third until I uh, hit that octave. So what compound interval are we looking at here? Well, I would say that's a major 10. That would be a major 10. Uh, let's do another one. Um, so. Oh boy. Okay, I'm going to try and do this process out loud, what I would be doing in my head, right? All right. So that lowest note. Da, and then I bring it up an octave. Yeah, and then, close enough. <laughs> and then it's just a matter of finding that other note. So. Yeah. I can't sing that high. You can't sing that high. (laughs) So we have to imagine now. We have to imagine. Well, to me, it sounds kind of minor sixty. It does sound very minor minor sixty. In fact, before I did any of that, you know, you could kind of hear that pull down to. Yeah, it wants to go down. Yeah, yeah. So you know, a lot of times, especially after you've done ear training a lot, you're going to hear lay soul as as a a big thing, right? Lay being the flat six as opposed to law. Right, in the and then. Scale. So what are we what are we playing here? Well, I guess we just have to do do a little bit of math and figure out what the uh, what the yeah, next step is. Yeah, just up. do your math. So that's a minor thirteenth. So the right? ninth would be the second chord. Tenth would be the third. Eleventh would be the fourth. Twelfth would be the fifth. Thirteenth would be the sixth. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so for for a lot of these for for a lot of these, especially ones that are diatonic to either the major or minor mode, uh, the these will be uh, you know, you'll you'll they'll have those melodic connotations to them, you know those sort of real music kind of connotations. Uh, to the ones that that are less like that, you know. Here we are, and then I. It's pretty high. I can probably sing high in my head. <laughs> yeah, you could probably sing higher in your head, yeah. Or, right? Yeah, I did notice, though, that that whole thing wanted to go up. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so so just for uh, uh, just for technical purposes, we're, si- we're doing a tritone here, yes. right? A compound tritone. Compound diminished 12th. Um, you probably heard that it wanted to go up. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so you, you're going to hear that it's going to want to go up. The way you kind of heard that a minor six uh, kind of wants to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, that's great when you can hear that. Uh, make sure you know what it wants to go up and down to. That'll be as that'll be as important in determining what interval you're hearing as anything else. Right. right. It's almost like you're kind of imagining what is to come. You know, yeah, almost future. kind of imagining what is to come. That's that's probably a valid way to try compound intervals. If the whole imagining the bottom note and octave octave up thing isn't working for you, mm-hmm. you know, it might be easier to just yeah, and then try to try to figure out where that wants to go. Then again, that's a hard one though, because that's a minor fourteenth, uh, so it doesn't really want to go anywhere. Really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, but you know, sometimes at least. You can sort of even maybe try singing down the scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I landed on tonic pretty quick. Mm. So that must be a major nine three. Yeah. Right? That two wants to go down to the one, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know. So there are a couple of little tricks there. You know, um, as with all ear training things, uh, pick the pick the process that gives you the best results, you personally the best results, and stick with it. Yeah. You know. Let's have a quick discussion. Let's have a quick discussion. On where ten- where certain scale degrees have a tendency to go. Like we said, I feel like two wants to go to one, right? Right, yeah. Three is pretty stable where it is because... Part of a tonic chord, so yeah, fairly chord. stable where it is. Although, um, I tell you, I have gotten in my head this sort of... Yes. Sort of with the majors there. That, that just... 
I hear a third and I sing down the scale almost naturally now. And that's that's a that's just a common thing for me. Uh-huh. But I find it's very helpful for me to help me recognize thirds. It does seem to want to go down to that root rather than go back up, up to the fifth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it wants to do that too. Like you said, it, it's it's pretty stable in itself. This is just singing down to that root is a, is a personal thing I've developed. That's cool. and, and I I recommend personal things. <laughs> well, that has actually helped me out though considerably. Yeah. So and then the four I think wants to go back down to the third typically, right? Uh, yes, yeah. So um, this is a very classic kind of motion here. Uh, So, is that a five seven to one? Or yep, five to one. Or something? Yes, that was five seven to uh, five seven to one. Okay, absolutely. So that four uh, just wanted to drop down to the three. Yeah, it's a, even a very common kind of a uh, suspension to talk about it to to give it a foreshadowing of an upcoming or maybe already had. I it, think actually we will have released non chord tones by now. Okay, so yeah, so it's uh. Oh, sorry. Ooh, I love that. Uh, yeah. That's, that Sus- sounds familiar. Suspensions, yeah. 4-3 suspension. So, uh, yeah. You know, you also hear the 4 going up to 5. You know, especially like in the bass line. That's a real common, uh, real common bass line, right? Yeah. So and then we move up, we and then we can move on to the five, which which is, goes to one. Uh, yeah, right? it's, it, it's got a one. real tendency to want to to, to move to, to one. More yeah. so in the bass, or definitely more so in the bass. Okay. Yeah, you, know, you can fool it by moving to six or something. You know, uh, but fool but, everyone. Yeah. But I, I think I think it's fair to say that most people, yeah, uh, when they hear five in the bass, they immediately think of it going to one. Very cool. Not that it can't do other stuff in actual music, but yeah, we're talking about tendencies, right? Yes, yes. Um, and I think this also helps to identify the notes if you kind of have an idea of where they're going to go. You know, that's yeah. helped me out. So yeah, yeah. Uh, a minor six. Yeah, that scale degree six definitely wants to resolve down to five. Yeah. Same thing for the major six. Hmm. Well, it's maybe a little bit less of a pull, but that that tendency is still there. You know. Again, not that they can't do other things, not that you can't totally you know, do that on a major six. It happens, you know, but, but out of context, its tendency is to kind of want to move down to five. Can I hear a minor six moving down and then a minor six moving up real quick? Yeah, so minor six moving down. Minor six moving up. little harmonic minor motion there up the harmonic minor scale right yep uh, killer yeah <laughs> and then major six going down and then major six going up so up a major scale that time mm-hmm. or up a melodic minor scale Yeah. That's the sixth. Yeah. The minor seven, remember that this is also a dominant seven, so it just kind of depends. You know, if you're in a dominant chord, it's going to want to resolve downward. You know, um, in other contexts, like in a mixolydian mode or something, it, it could be fairly stable slash want to resolve up to tonic. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's hard to p- pin a real strong tendency tone on the minor seven. Yeah. Other than in the context of a dominant chord, it's going to want to resolve downward. Yeah. Uh, major seven definitely wants to resolve up to that octave. Yeah, it's a big so, difference. So. Hey, for the sevens, can we do compound for, for just for giggles and? Yeah, you know, let's do compound. For so, sevens. uh, minor fourteenth. Yeah. And like I said, this is this is kind of hard, right? There's not a lot of tendency tone motion either way. If you're imagining this though as a dominant seven, you know, then it definitely wants to resolve downward. Yeah. Right, because then it's scale degree four going down to scale degree three. 
right? Uh, yeah, so that's the that's the minor seventh slash minor fourteenth. You know? and then the major seventh, of course, is definitely, uh, definitely, definitely wanting to, right? Yeah. So that makes I mean that makes perfect sense now, but I, I do remember my struggles. Um, early in theory with the major seven versus the minor seven. And it just goes back to being able to project the next note to come. Yeah. it You know, ear training takes a lot of mental ability. I think a lot of people get kind of frustrated when they think, well, I'm supposed to just hear this and, and know. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there's a mental process going on in, in figuring it out. You know? The more you do it, the smoother the paths those neurons are. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, out. exactly. And and if you do that enough, it will come to a point where you can figure it out really fast, fast enough that it seems like you're just looking at it and knowing. You know, I mean, when you're reading words, you know, you're not having to sound them out anymore. You know, in your adult life, right? Yes. But when you first started, you had to kind of, you know, sound out every letter and and things like that to 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 help you learn. <laughs> and we we're all learning. And because we were so cute, those were joyous times for our parents. <laughs> yeah. But now that we're older, it can be kind of frustrating for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now let's talk about some of these um, kind of inharmonic namings, if that's the proper way to say it. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, for example, we may have mentioned in passing the diminished octave at one point. Right. Uh. Which we actually just kind of covered, didn't we? Yeah, it's kind of a, what, it, what interval is that, Jeremy? Well, it sounds to me like the major seven. Well, it, it should. It is the major seventh. We call that inharmonically equivalent. You know, the, it's the same two notes as in a major seventh. You know, it's just, you know, an octave in which the top note has been dropped down. So in that sense, it is a diminished octave. Now, what is there different scenarios where we would use the term diminished octave compared to the major seven? Because I... I don't think I've ever heard the term diminished octave. Diminished octave is kind of a rare one, uh -huh. to be honest. Uh, there are terms, there are places where you would use the term, for example, augmented second. And yeah. when we're running up a, a uh, harmonic minor uh, scale, for example, mm -hmm. you know, that those uh, those uh, last couple of notes, you know, um, this is actually a minor third, right? Uh, but its equivalent is an augmented second. We call that so to uh, point notice to the fact that this uh, major second that is common, you know, uh, has actually been raised. Right. So whereas natural minor, yeah. Yeah. Ma major second, right? that second has become augmented in harmonic minor. Because if you're moving within a scale, it's all set. It's basically Yeah, seconds. it's all seconds. It you got to sort of seconds. account for the fact that you have one of every note name, right? If a third comes up, you typically think you're in some kind of triad situation. Yeah, and you, think, you typically think of yourself as having skipped a note in the scale, right? Yeah. So that's why in, term, in context of the scale itself, we're calling this an augmented second instead of a minor third. Yeah. For that reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Oh, like, is there a time, if you're, if, okay, if you're doing like a chord progression, mm -hmm. is there a time where the same major third, depending on the progression you choose, might yeah. resolve up instead of resolving down? Something like that, you know what I mean? Possibly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, possibly. You would, it is, we tend to want to call intervals simple things. Huh. So if it's a major third, we want to call it a major third. Uh-huh. You know. <laughs> Not a diminished fourth. <laughs> Not a diminished, not a diminished fourth, right? <laughs> you tend to want to call it a major third. Now you know if it's written as a diminished fourth, you know, then then you, I guess you kind of have to call it diminished fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be strange. Yeah, <laughs> you don't know? see a lot of that. Uh, no, you, you you don't see a lot of that. You know, um, we tend to try to keep things simple this way. That satisfied my curiosity. I would say good. Here's another. Here's here's kind of another thing about intervals that I don't think was really touched on a whole lot in ear training. Mm -hmm. For me, like a lot of the ear training that we do, I think for, and for our students, right. we kind of use that middle, mid range of the piano. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's listen to a major third right there in the middle of the piano. Now let's hear the lowest possible major third you can give me. Kind of muddy, right? 
lot muddy. And if your piano's out of tune, that's where it's going to be out of tune. It's going to be even worse, right? Yeah. And yeah, and a lot of people have issues with really low or, you know, really high. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's almost... Uh, this is just a matter of practice. Uh-huh. Uh, I would practice these lower intervals, and it's just the same strategy. Sing the bottom note. Sing the top note. Um, and, then, and then use that to determine the interval. Nice. Yeah. Give me one. Give you one, huh? Closing my eyes. <laughs> Ooh. Huh. Is that just a major second? It is just a major second. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So how did you how did you get there? I squinted and I <laughs> furrowed and I burned a lot of brain cells. I don't know. No, I mean I, I don't burned know. Burned a lot of brain cells. Does it sound like the first two notes of a major scale? That must have been it. Or did it sound like, to me, it actually sounded like flat seven to one. You know, like. Hmm. Let's hear that same example on the extreme high end. That same example? Or do you want or a new one? different example. Let's, Let's do, give you a different hit example. Me. Hit me. Uh, All right, one more time. There's something very consonant happening here. Yes. So you heard that consonant. I did, even on that way high end. Mm-hmm. Is that a perfect fifth? Very, very close. Perfect fourth. Yeah, there you go. Easy, easy to mix those two up. Uh, this is this is a common mistake. Uh-huh. You know, uh, sing sol, do, and then sing do, sol. And one of those is going to sound more right than the other. Right? Mm. So even up here. Uh-huh. Or. Do, sol. Uh, which, one, which one sounded? The first one. I yeah. Right. So sol do is a perfect fourth. Okay. Do sol is a perfect fifth. But right. if you had done that in the middle of the piano, I don't think I would have had the same struggle that I just oh, did. Oh, probably not. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a perfect fifth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, versus. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but those are very, very. Don't don't beat yourself up too bad when you when you miss a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth. Those are hard. Especially uh, in the extreme ranges. Especially, yeah. Everything is harder in the extreme registers. The uh, same techniques and strategies still apply. It's just it's just all more difficult and takes more practice. I wonder if that has something to do with you know how like the electric guitar playing lead and the cello, how how beautiful. Right. And they're kind of they're kind of in that range of the human voice, you know. Yeah. And I think that we evolved to kind of be more sensitive to the things that are in the range of our. Vocal. Yeah, we have a lot more experience communicating in those range, in those ranges, you know. And a music, music is kind of a language into itself, you know. So you don't hear as many songs that are just a bunch of that's just bass, uh, <laughs> unless you heard our opening. Well, yeah, unless you heard our bass episode. <laughs> but even then, you know, I was up the no, oh, yeah, you too. upper you, end of the you were bass, way high and you were at the lower end, right? You know? Yeah. So, so um, that's just one other little thing that I think is worth mentioning because mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of attention was given to it when I was in school. But I think that the only solution <clears throat> to familiarizing yourself with these is, is just sit there at a piano or any kind yeah. of MIDI instrument that that can produce those lower yeah. notes yeah. or higher and, notes. And you know, a lot of a lot of ear training software will randomize the range, mm. you know, and that's good. That's very good. Yeah, we talked we didn't, about we that. didn't do that enough when we were we were given. We were assigned, or at least in, in my ear training class, we were assigned uh, McGamut. Yes. To do, yeah, and we probably didn't do enough of it. Yeah. <laughs> I got the, I got just the amount of hours I was supposed to get. Oh yeah, but me I too. Wasn't, I wasn't sitting me too, down, and then I was done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's frustrating, you know. It's, it's frustrating to do this, you know. You don't have that passion most people towards ear training that they do to to their instrument, mm -hmm. and yet it requires. Almost as much practice and, and almost as much dedication. You know, um, I think you really have to kind of get out in the world a little bit and really understand 
what a significant benefit it is to be able to hear these things when you're playing music or even just listening to music. You know, you have to get out into the world and hear that enough and get to the point in your life where it's like, I wish my ear training was better Mm -hmm. to to really start to appreciate why we're putting you through this, you know? What would you say to a musician who plays just a a monophonic instrument, like um, a a whistle, for example, Mm. or a flute who alone can't really experience the harmonic intervals? Uh... I would say intervals are extraordinarily important to you because as a melodic instrument, all you're playing is a sequence of intervals, right? Yep. Yeah. You know? So, But I think that they're going to have an easier time, I think, distinguishing melodic intervals than harmonic intervals, don't you? Probably, Maybe. yeah. Uh, that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse. You know, Uh-oh. I mean, if you're playing uh, any melodic instrument, you are going to be playing with people who are creating some kind of harmony. Correct. You know, um, you're going to want to understand what they're doing. Yeah. Because that will that will enable you to be a musician, and not just a person playing an instrument. Hey, well you know? put, man. Yeah. Well so put. you'll be able to contribute to uh, discussions about the harmony. You'll be able to have thoughtful feedback and and insightful and valuable opinions about uh, what's going on, what could be going on that's better. Mm-hmm. You know, such things like that. Where your part is in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's difficult to put into words the value of this stuff. You know, you just have to go out and you know you'll get there. You'll get to that point where you wish your ear training was better. If it's not as good as you want it to be, right? Mm-hmm. If it's if it's not at a certain level, you'll get to that point. Hey, I have a I have a recommendation. I have a yeah. something we can try if we're just melody monophonic melody players like a flute or a whistle. Mm-hmm. Why don't you in your head sing a harmony? Or not in your head, but actually, you know, yeah. like Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull? Right, right, yeah. He did some really cool kind of stuff where he would actually be singing, doo, 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 <laughs> like while he's playing, <laughs> yeah. and actually playing something different than what he's singing. So essentially, there is a harmony. There's a, there's a sort of there. harmony going on, yeah, yeah. That might be kind of hard while you're blowing out air yeah. from your mouth to the whistle. And then Sounds like an interesting technique, The yeah. harmony's coming out of your nose. Yeah, yeah. Sounds I might, like an interesting technique. I might not use this, but let me just see if I can kind of kind of pull this off because um, I have my penny whistle here. So if I play, there's my D note. If I try and harmonize on a note, like a third. Ah, there you go. I was on the right track. You were on I the might right. can use that. I don't know. <laughs> but there you go. Harmony yeah. with the monophonic instrument. There, oh, yeah. you, there you go, yeah. And, and even if you want, don't want to... Uh, getting to doing that, you know, uh, remember that harmony is itself created from melody. That when four instruments play melodically together, that is how we create harmony. So you're a part of this. You need to understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. And your role. And your role, yeah. Very cool. Yep. The only other thing I might add to our discussion on um, intervals and some of the problems we run into is something I wish I mentioned in the other episode, the the basic intervals episode, and I don't think I did. Or maybe I did, but either way, I'll say it again for emphasis, just in case. Most musicians write. Yeah. Right? Um, write your own compound intervals. Write a song that starts off the very first note in this piece that you write is, is the interval that you're having the most problem with. Yeah. It's always a good thing. It's always a good way to get anything in your ears. Once I've created something and I've played it and recorded it, Sing yeah. along to it. It's in my head. You know, it's my it's my baby. Yeah. You love your baby. I'll tell you, for me, a lot of these intervals that give me the least trouble are the ones that I, I, I know it's because I've used them. Oh, yeah. You know, like uh, the, the minor six that, you know, I know I have used that in, in compositions. Uh, um. So, so, <laughs> so did other people who work for HBO, apparently. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right, so. <laughs> well, what else can we say about intervals, man? I think it's pretty wrapped up at this point. You know, uh, Always practice them. Uh-huh. You know, uh, always practice your melodic dictation, which in which you know, intervals is a thing. You know, uh, knowing your intervals will help you with your melodic dictation. Being good at melodic dictation will help you with your intervals. Back and forth. There's a back and forth there. Yeah. And here's a mean thing to do to yourself from time to time. Play a note and try and sing a minor second above that while (laughs) playing the same note. (laughs) 
Now that's easier to do than the yeah. minor second. Yeah. Jeez, that was good, Matt. Yeah. Mean stuff to do to yourself. Mean stuff to do to yourself, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it just takes practice, just like everything else. And, and practicing those things is, it actually gets to be kind of fun after a while, you know. So we got basic intervals, we got compound intervals, we talked about some of the challenges within. Yep. Uh, if there's anything else you guys can think of that you want to know about intervals or questions that you have to ask, you know where to find us. Info at musicstudent101.com. All right. We really want to thank all of our listeners for your support and your engagement. You can continue to help by spreading the word and rating us on your preferred podcast app. 